I have quite a few heroes in the extreme enduro scene, but without a doubt, my biggest heroes are everyday guys who are still riding dirt bikes in their 60s and 70s, like Larry Murray and Paul Rodden. I've had the pleasure of riding with both these guys, and it's a privilege to host this documentary about them on my channel. My first motorcycle, it literally came out of a chicken house. You've always heard these yeah. stories about somebody getting a motorcycle out of a barn or chicken house. This thing came out of an old chicken house and uh, we had to rebuild it, had a rod out of it, piston out of it. We used the uh, machine shop at the University of Arkansas in the evenings when we get our homework done. We'd slip over there and sometimes work till midnight. In the 60s and early 70s, everything was uh, standard suspension, right? Yeah. A cantilever shock to a point, and the brakes were all drum. The problem was staying on them because they were thrashing you around so much, and it was almost impossible to stop them. What about you, Paul? Was the early bikes, they didn't even have foot pegs that folded up. Wait till, yeah. you, wait till you put a foot down in front of a solid foot peg. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah. Motorcyclists or off-roaders will spend literally thousands of dollars to try to take 10 or 15 pounds of weight off their bike. And young guys are the worst, okay? You, you know, they'll spend a fortune, you know, replacing a part. Uh, levers, I remember this one, Steve was his name, great kid. Uh, and he was paying like $100 for a brake and clutch lever. Some young kid come up to him and said, hey, I just bought a new motorcycle and this and that. And I've got $300 left over. What do you think I should spend it on? Make me faster. And I looked at him and told him, $300 worth of gas through it will make you a lot faster. Larry's a very talented rider. I, I am absolutely sure he has more talent than I ever did. We're about 11, uh, 10 or 11 years. I'm older than he is. I watch him ride and um, there's just something about the way he does it. And Larry just seems, no matter what he hits, he just seems to float through it. He always gets the good line. Uh, aggravates you, you know? Why can't I do that? I had a friend of mine, a guy that kind of took me underneath uh, his wing. Bert Irwin was his name. He was a flat tracker, a pro in the U.S. And Bert took me up to the Rouge River up in Quebec. And all we did the, the whole day was learn how to ride dirt roads very fast. And I mean like crazy fast, like probably 130, 140 kilometers an hour on twisty windy roads that just followed the Rouge River. And uh, all the steering was done with the throttle. Rider position, don't even move the bars. So you drive the whole bike just like a flat tracker, skidding all the time. It was just one great big afternoon of a controlled skid. My first real bike experience, big accident on a bike, big incident, was I was four years old and there was this red brick bungalow with this porch on it with uh, cement steps going down to the sidewalk. I'll never forget, and the prettiest little blonde girl, she probably was three, I was four, maybe going on five. And we were riding tricycles around up on top of this porch and I looked over here and I thought, I bet I can ride my tricycle down those steps. <laughs> And sure enough, I did, but at the bottom step, of course, I tumbled over and I cut my lip. I cut my lip from here almost to my ear, and they put, I think, 20 stitches on the inside, 20 stitches or 20-some stitches on the outside. I still have a big scar and a little bit of a slur in there from, <laughs> from all the scar tissue. I got my first bike. I was 15, and um, it was about a three-year-old Honda 90, 90cc, little street bike. 
my God, I put that thing through the test. It was like pushed it to every limit the poor thing had and uh, learned very quickly that for my attitude on a motorcycle, I needed a much more controlled environment where I wasn't going to be doing 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers through some school zone. So I quickly got into dirt biking where I could get all of that out of my body, I guess, all that speed out. Because you can go slow and still be scaring yourself to death in the woods. <laughs> I saw Paul at uh, the Highlands Golf Course for the first time, and somebody mentioned, you know, this guy Paul's going to ride with us. And yeah, lots of people often join us. And um, Paul comes in, and he's like old, like old, old. Not just like kind of old, but old, like 70 old, you know. And I, I kind of couldn't compute for a second. I was like, this guy's going to ride with us? Or, I was like, oh. I, th I, I kind of was thinking, oh, there goes the ride, honestly, because... When we usually go, we're usually cooking with gas. You know, we want to have fun out there and haul the mail. And um, I thought, okay, well, obviously we're just going to have a casual ride. That's fine, whatever. Um, and then he starts suiting up and he's got all the appropriate gear. And by the time he was all dressed, it really doesn't matter anymore. We get on the trail and the guy is handling the bike just like any one of us, you know. Clearly super experienced. Paul's been riding off-road motorcycles most of his life, and he has figured out that the secret to being a good off-road rider is the physical side of it, being in good physical conditioning. There's a story out there that Paul has a logbook that he keeps on all his exercising activities, and every day he writes down what he did, whether he went riding, rode his bicycle, or went running. Well, the doctor told me with my balance problems that I shouldn't be riding and uh, they actually told me that 10 years ago when it first started with this ear. Uh, he didn't think I should ride my bicycle, he didn't think I should ride the motorcycle. And there are times with this type of disease when you have the very violent spinning, yeah, you need to be careful because it could hit you, but I'm at the point now where mine is just a nuisance. It's a merry-go-round feel. It's a not quite connected, a, a bad hangover feel, I guess. And, and uh, uh, sometimes it's not a lot of fun, but it's getting better and it's got to get better. I mean, you can't quit, right? Get on with riding or get on with dying, one or the other. I got to thinking about Larry's brakes. He kept talking about brakes. I kept talking about suspension. Well, maybe that tells me something. Maybe Larry was going fast enough. He needed brakes, and I wasn't going fast enough. So brakes wasn't a, brakes weren't a problem for me. Yahoo! Good job. Almost. my attitude is so positive while I'm while I'm riding I don't know it's because it's fun uh, sometimes if I'm in a race or uh, even when I'm riding I'll get disgusted at myself because I I get offline I don't pick a good line I miss a gear I, I do something and you know sometimes I'll do a little gritching or cussing or you know why did I do that dummy you know but the hill climb yesterday I ended up dumbing up not quite making it and but hey what we were doing out there was we were having fun and a little bit of it was poor maintenance on my part i didn't have my auto clutch set up quite right and it it kind of bit me but it's a hobby it's it's supposed to be fun you're supposed to be out there having fun and, and truly if you're not enjoying it go load up As you get older, it, your vision is not near as good. And uh, what amazes me is I watch Larry, I follow him, and and it's like the, kind of the faster you go to a point, the better it is because you're bouncing over some stuff. You're not, you're, you don't want to just slam it, but you want to pick the smooth lines. And that's the difference between the fast guys, I think, and, and the people that just 
or writers, good writers, is is they see things different or something because I get to writing even now and it's like everything's coming at me as fast as I can respond. I, I can't, you know, I can't see it, I can't respond any quicker. And if you're with a guy like Larry or somebody, they just, and it's, how can they do that? I can't see it any quicker. I can't respond to it any quicker. And if I go too quick then, then I don't see it and that's when I start clipping this stuff and ricocheting off things and not writing smooth, uh, solid, like you're on a rail. I like to feel like I'm, I've got the suspension right and it's just floating on and you're basically on a rail. Even in the, even in the choppy stuff, you know, it's, it's, when it lands, you, you feel it, it's planted. Don't assume that because people are older than you that they're going to be slower than you and, and big time because coming from the mountain bike world and being like a, a cyclist who ride road bikes and, and mountain bikes on, on competitions, I thought it's going to be a walk in the park, you know, just give me three weeks, a month, you know, with the dirt bike and I'm going to be keeping up with the fast guys. <laughs> Mistake. <laughs> The Husqvarna motorcycle's manual that came with the new Husky when you bought it. You know, it's how to change your oil and all of that stuff. And it was just this manual. And I would say half of the manual was dedicated to personal conditioning. You know, the owner's manual for your motorcycle is half dedicated to conditioning. So I can't, you know, I can't tell anymore than that. Like, look at Paul, right? 71. Yeah. <laughs> got the guns, how do you do that, you know? So for guys like Paul and I, and I'm like a decade younger, you know, we still, when we go into a room with, with our peers in age, you know, there's no diabetes here, right? There's none of that stuff, you know? We eat our vegetables. Dr. Curran, Dr. Dan Curran, 225. A lot of them have a uh, are, are have significant arthritis, so their their knees are really sore, and they um, and their hips are sore, and they don't move very well because a lot of their joints are worn out. That's probably the main thing that limits people in their 60s and 70s from doing very much. But riding off road is a is a totally different thing. I mean, it were, it's a incredibly physical experience, and it's, I think it's hard to get a sense for it unless you have experienced it firsthand. But when you're on the bike and you're trying to balance this 400 pound machine as you're weaving it through the forest and you're trying to avoid obstacles and lift the wheel up to get over up a steep hill climb and and the bike despite the sort of modern suspension is getting pounded every which way and you're standing the whole time and your whole kind of core is contracting and you're trying to make sure that you stay balanced on the bike which is again going back to the Meniere's thing that's an amazing thing that uh, Paul can do that and stay balanced because that's really his problem is the balance issue but uh, um, but that whole experience of riding on a trail, within about 20 minutes, if you haven't done it before, a new rider would be absolutely cooked. The best way I can describe that is to use, to use myself as an example because I've, I've been riding off-road for a couple of years and one of the things I noticed very quickly is that I would get tired really quickly and I was unable to finish uh, a, a trail or unable to finish a day without, without really slowing the group down. Um, so I had to start training and running and, uh, and uh, for about a year I had to train on a treadmill up to the point where I could run 30 or 40 minutes without stopping every day before I got to the point where I could ride and keep up with guys like Larry and Paul, which, which uh, really surprised me and I think surprises a lot of people when they don't know how, how hard it is to ride off-road.
That was fun anyway. Yeah. I'm glad it was you. Sorry I dropped my bike. Yeah, you should have thrown me a tow rope. I threw you a rock. It was, you were riding too slow. <laughs> had nothing to do with rider ability or No, it had nothing other. to do with rider ability. Actually, I was in second gear and I should have been in first. Probably the second or third oldest guy in a club of 275 total members, right? Um, so, and I've made tons of friends. My friends are 30 and 40. I don't have any, I don't have any close 50, 60 year old friends that don't have motorcycles. I don't have them. I don't have any old people friends, nor do I want any. <laughs> You know, well, it, except it, for Paul. Well, yeah. <laughs> a good friend of Paul's and mine died here a year and a half ago, and Steve Garnsey, um, being out in the trail on a nice afternoon and falling over and having a heart attack and dying. I'm okay. I talked it over with April um, and my wife, and uh, she's okay with it, and I'm okay with it, and the family doesn't suffer, you really don't suffer too much. Um, you can go out kind of with a, a smile 30 minutes ago on your face, you know? And there's, so I, I think I'm, ha I, I'm pretty comfortable with that, you know? There's, there's, there's one, one side of that story I never considered, and, and I happened to be the guy that was with Steve that day that he had his heart attack, is uh, I've often said, I've, I've probably said it a thousand times, you know, what a way to go, just out there riding and, you know, whatever it happens to be, whether an accident or a heart attack or whatever, you know, just check it out on the trail. Well, that's fine, and, and I still, to myself, but what I didn't realize was the stress that it puts on the gone. person with you, and I, I still to this day wonder, did we, did I do the right thing? And... I can't second guess it, I can't change it, and I'm sure we did the right thing. I don't see quitting uh, if I can keep my balance thing working a little bit. I just don't see quit riding uh, yeah. at any time in the near, near future, you know. I, I'd like to think I can go on another six or eight years. I look forward never stopping. My dream would be to be able to ride right up until I die. I cannot even imagine an injury that would keep me off the bike. I think I could ride with one arm. I think I could ride with one leg. I can ride definitely with a half a brain. 